Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. I'm continuing to get a lot of questions from you guys, so for today I thought I would answer some of the more commonly asked questions, including quite a few that I haven't addressed before. And we'll also look at some beautiful boas like this one, so be sure to stay tuned. So let me just grab my list right here so that I remember the questions you asked. Okay, so question number one. You have an amazing boa collection. With so many to choose from, how do you pick the boas that will star in each video? Well, this is different for each video and probably the most common way I pick them is I want boas to illustrate specific concepts I'm going to discuss in the video. For example, if I'm talking about Suriname red tail boas, I'm obviously going to show some of my different Suriname red tail boas like this one so you can see what they look like. If I was talking about a specific behavior of boas, I may pick a boa that exhibited that behavior and if it was say a challenging behavior like aggression or you know lack of feeding or something like that I might relate a story about how I dealt with that or you know tips to get around that kind of a challenge. Another way is that certain boas I just like to have in videos. You've probably seen I take out my Anorithristic Peregrinera uh, Peninsula boa quite a bit just because I really like to handle that boa and it's a very beautiful boa to look at. And then lately you may have seen I'm not showing a lot of my usual boas uh, and the reason is is because they're in breeding trials right now and I don't want to disturb them I just want them to focus on making baby boas so you may have noticed relatively few boas over the last few months as many of my regular stars are in breeding trials but you know I haven't shown this boa in many videos at all. This is a 2018 holdback Suriname red tail boa. Uh, this is a female that I'm growing up as a future breeder. Nice looking boa, but just doesn't get much airtime because I've got so much competition with all my other Surinams. But it's a good thing that some of these boas that don't get a chance are now getting more of a chance to be seen on video. Okay, the second question. Boa breeders are just cranking out offspring like puppy mills. It's going to cause all kinds of problems with excessive amounts of boas. Why do you promote breeding? Okay, so that was a bit of a loaded question. And so uh, what I first want to say is that boa breeding is not for everyone. If you're going to be thinking about boas or breeding boas, you should really make sure that you're all set to do this and that you have a plan for all the babies, okay? Even if that means holding on to the babies for six months, a year, or even longer. You don't want to breed boas unless there's a market for the babies and you're reasonably confident you'll be able to place the babies in decent homes. Boa breeding can also be a lot more involved and more challenging than you might like to think. People see the pictures of these beautiful litters with these gorgeous baby boas and they don't see all of the hard work that goes in and all of the attempts that don't work out and maybe there's an adverse medical effect of breeding the boa on the breeders. So be sure you fully understand the responsibility of breeding boas before getting into it. That being said, I really disagree with the premise of the question that claims that there's all kinds of excessive boas on the market. There really are not. And if you breed boas that people want, you know, like most of the locality boas, pure locality boas, really there's a huge demand for them. And I would not think that you would have any difficulty finding decent homes for them. So I think as long as the boa hobby market doesn't change all that much, it will continue to be that way and there'll be more people wanting boas than there are boas that are available. Okay, so the next question, and I get similar questions to this a lot. So someone will send me a picture and they ask, is my boa from Suriname or from Guyana? Okay, and there's no way that I can tell you from a picture um, I can basically look at the picture, I can tell you, well, it's consistent with a true red tail boa from either Guiana or Suriname or possibly even Brazil or French Guiana, but there's no way that I can say 100%. And in fact, the vast majority of locality boas, if you don't have the specific locality information, you can't tell just by looking at the boa. You can tell that it's, it's consistent with a given locality, but you can't tell for sure that it actually came from that locality. So if you have a ball like this, 
just be happy with the boa you know um a lot of people are really obsessed and they want to know everything possible about their given boa but in many cases that information has just been lost because the breeders or the keepers of the boas didn't really keep a good record of the information and unfortunately it was lost so it's always a good idea to keep as much information as you can about your boas and to pass it along if you end up breeding more boas or selling the boas but once that information is gone you can't really get it back there's some other types of locality boas like some of the island boas that are a little more specific so you can look at the boa and you can say well yeah that definitely looks like a hog island boa but again it's really hard to prove 100 percent that that's exactly where it came from or even that it's pure. So um, unfortunately, there's only so much you can tell just from a picture. Uh, in theory, we could use DNA testing to do DNA profiling of boas like they do with dogs. But unfortunately, these testing services are just not available and they're probably not gonna become available in the near future for a number of reasons. Okay, so the next question. My boa's tail keeps twitching and sometimes his head twitches as well. Why is this the case? So there's a few reasons why your boa's head, tail, and or other body parts might be twitching. So the most common reason why is that your boa is a little uncomfortable or annoyed. So sometimes they will kind of shake parts of their body to express um, lack of comfort or, you know, their um, a little irritated you know some snakes will actually shake their tail in a little way which is thought to mimic a rattlesnake and you see this a lot with like corn snakes and king snakes and other colubrids where they make this tail uh, wiggling movement and it's thought that maybe they're trying to mimic a rattlesnake and scare away predators with boas i think it's less likely that they're trying to mimic a rattlesnake and it's more likely that this is just a kind of a general behavior that snakes do when they're not very comfortable they might be looking for a hiding place so if they're doing that in the cage you might want to add extra hiding places i'll see my boas will sometimes show like body language that they're not very comfortable when they're um, feeling insecure or they want something to grip onto so you might add some logs or some cork bark hides or something like that that gives the boa hiding place and a, a, a rough surface to grip onto the other possibility that is why your boa is doing this twitching is some kind of a neurological issue so the boa might have some kind of neurological disease uh, or the boa might have expo been exposed to a toxin that's neurotoxic. And so we hear a lot about inclusion body disease, and that is certainly a neurological disease that can affect boas. I would say the majority of times when people see this kind of symptom, it's not inclusion body disease. Uh, inclusion body disease, typically the animals form this kind of contorted shape. They're kind of all knotted up and they do this symptom called stargazing where the boa will hold his head up at an abrupt angle to his neck and kind of like look up like this. But the majority of times, this isn't what's happening. Um, if your boa was exposed to a toxin like mite spray, you know, permethrin and, you know, preventa mite spray or, you know, the, the, uh, med, the bedding spray that's used a lot to kill mites. If in, in large enough amounts that can be neurotoxic and it can cause this kind of symptom in a boa. So you definitely want to be careful when you're using this anti-mite spray. The next question concerns how sellers will designate the origin of some of the boas that they have for sale. And the questioner asks, what is the difference between wild caught, captive bred, captive born and bred and farm bred. And so you may also see these abbreviated WC is wild caught, CB means captive born or captive bred, CBB means captive bred and born, and then finally farm bred, you could say FB, although I've, I don't think I've seen it abbreviated that way. Okay, so a wild caught animal is an animal that was sourced in the wild in its native habitat, for example, a Colombian boa was taken from Colombia, you know, a Peruvian boa from Peru, etc. So this is an animal removed from the wild. So wild caught animals are nowhere nearly as available as they used to be. Uh, the reptile industry many decades ago was primarily wild caught animals, but people learned how to 
breed them in captivity, and they produce much higher quality, much healthier offspring that could be um, obtained for a lower price. So captive uh, bred animals are definitely better in general than wild caught animals as far as a pet. As far as um, wild caught animals, the one reason why people would want to get them these days is to get fresh bloodlines and new unrelated genes from the wild and therefore they can um, reduce the possibility of inbreeding depression in the captive populations. But in general, wild caught animals need to be acclimated and especially with animals like true red tail boas, there's a much higher mortality rate. It's much harder, especially for a beginner. So I would recommend only seasoned um, people who've been doing this a while should think about getting a wild caught animal. You'll see them for sale typically half the price of a captive bred animal. But when you think about all the vet care they're going to need and all of the uncertainty, it's definitely more cost effective to go for a captive bred animal. Okay, so you might see CB, so that's captive bred, and then there's also CBB, captive born in bred. So typically most CB, most captive, uh, or even CB meaning captive born, most captive born animals were also bred in captivity. So it's implied for most captive bred animals, or captive born animals rather, they were bred in captivity. And that means that the breeding and the birth happened in captivity. However, there's kind of a, a sneaky way that people can call something captive born but really in some cases it was from a pregnant female that was wild caught so in rare instances someone will import a wild caught female who's gravid and she has the babies and so you could say well those are captive born but they're not captive bred and so that doesn't happen all that too often um, in, the, in that case, if you can get a captive born animal that's not captive bred, this might be advantageous as far as introducing new bloodlines, but it's probably gonna be a little harder to establish the captivity than a captive bred and born animal. Um, although it, this doesn't really happen all that often. And so then the final possibility is something known as farm bred. And what farm bred means is that the animal was bred in its native habitat in the native country of origin but in either some kind of a farm-like setting. So sometimes what happens is people will collect gravid female boa constrictors from the wild. They maintain them in an outdoor setting until they have the babies, and then they'll sell all the babies. And that's known as a farm bred. In other cases, it's the animals are actually bred at the facility, but it's kind of more of an outdoor facility, typically in the native habitat. They might have outdoor enclosures set up in the native habitat where the animals normally live, and they're, they're breeding them in there, and they're producing the babies in there. So it's a little bit of a hybrid between like a wild caught situation and a captive bred situation. Farm bred animals typically are harder to acclimate, of course, than the captive bred animals since they have to be imported. And I actually, I only have three farm bred animals in my collection. I have a trio of these beautiful Aikidos Peruvian boas I got a few years ago. And you know, they're doing great so far. In fact, I'm uh, doing my first breeding attempt as we speak, so hopefully some baby animals later this year. But in general, I've heard that a lot of these farm bred animals don't do all that well, and a lot of them will end up dying in the first year or so. So you gotta be a little bit more careful if you're gonna buy a farm bred animal. The next two questions are kind of related, so I'll kind of answer them together. And I get a lot of similar questions. So one question, which morph should I get? And then the next question, what is the best breeding project to get into with boas? And so I get this a lot, and a lot of this just comes down to your own opinion. You want to get into a project or get a pet boa that you're really going to enjoy, and it's something you want. Okay, don't get something because you think, well, I'm gonna breed this in 10 years and make a lot of money, or you know everyone else is getting this boa, so I'm gonna get it too. Get the boa that you want. So with that in mind, as far as the first question, which morph should I get? I'm assuming that someone who asked this question doesn't have a lot of experience with morphs. So I would say get a morph that's been around for a little bit of a while, and the price is already bottomed out, because when morphs start off, they're typically thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. And then within you know 10 years or so, often they get down to the several hundred dollar range. So pick something that you like that's already kind of bottomed out in price so you don't have to worry about the price crash. 
And then you probably should also get a morph that doesn't have too many genes in there, but that the genes complement each other well. And examples of this are things like uh, hypo jungles and uh, sun glows and moon glows, you know, animals where the genes really look nice together, you know, at least in my opinion. As far as what boa you should breed, you, as I mentioned, you definitely want to breed something that you like so that if it takes six months or a year for you to sell the babies, you're fine just holding on to them. But you also want to get a breeding project that's going to have a decent demand because you don't want to be producing a lot of boas that no one is going to want in their collection. So you want to focus on quality. For locality boas, you want to focus on pure animals that have a known lineage. And you want to keep track of the lineage so that you can offer it to the uh, owners of the babies that you produce. With morph projects, you want to focus on the top notch examples of that particular morph because there's often a lot of variability in quality of a given morph, depending not on the morph gene itself, but on the tens of thousands of other genes in the BOA's genetic background. So, and, you know, at the beginning of the project, you know, pay a little extra, get the best quality animals you can get, and the quality of the offspring is going to be that much better, and they're going to be that much more desirable by future owners. We really want to be constantly improving the quality of boas that are produced uh, in captivity, just, you know, so that the hobby continues to improve and people continue to have better and better boas generation after generation. Next question, what is your opinion about having a kinked boa as a pet. And so just a bit of background, a kink boa is a boa that has a curvature in its spine or some kind of a kinking defect in its spine or tail. And so kink boas are one of the most common uh, malformations that we see breeding boas. It's not uncommon to have a boa with a kink, either a minor or major kink, um, every few litters. So I've seen this a few times before. It's not typically something that you can prevent. You know, in some cases it's caused by inappropriate incubation conditions, like the females kept too hot or too cold, but in many cases it's not really preventable. And so you might have a boa born with a kink. Um, the kinking can be very minor. In some cases it's just a small little kink in the tail that you can barely see, and only by feeling carefully do you know it's there. In other cases it's a pretty major kink, and the boa might have like this abrupt uh, angled kink in its backbone. Um, sometimes I've seen animals with the kink near their neck and these animals there's no way they could eat because the kinking will prevent the boa from swallowing the food but in many cases it's relatively minor. So with a boa with a major kink unfortunately these animals are not going to be able to survive because they're not going to be able to eat and digest the food because of the kink so unfortunately these animals would need to be euthanized. In some cases with the very minor kink, the animal can live fine, doesn't have an impact on the life of the animal. So in that case, these animals are fine as pets. Um, typically people will sell boas with kinks at around half of the normal price because of the defect. And I don't recommend that boas with kinks be used as breeders. You know, that would be a very bad idea. Um, in most cases, the kink itself is probably not genetic in the sense that you're not going to pass on the specific kink to the offspring, but you might have a higher chance that the offspring would have these kinks. In addition, the kinking can sometimes interfere with, you know, normal reproduction. If the, you know, a female animal has a kink and it's, uh, uh, posterior half of its body, it might have difficulty delivering the babies and may end up dying trying to deliver the babies. So it's really a terrible idea to try to breed these animals. That being said, if you want a pet boa that you're not going to breed and someone has an animal with a kink, provided it's a minor kink, I would say that it might make a very good pet and I wouldn't have any concern with buying such a boa as long as you're not planning on using it for breeding. Okay, so another question, and I begin questions like this a lot. Um, actually, multiple questions. Do you have a website? Where do you sell your boas? Can you give me information about your boa sales or what websites you use? Do you use Morph Market? And so, first off, I don't have a website. 
you know, websites these days seem a little antiquated. It seems like it was kind of more of a thing to have a website back in the late 90s, early 2000s. With social media, YouTube, Facebook, etc., Instagram, it's a lot more dynamic and it's a lot easier to keep updated than a traditional website. So I get asked a lot if I use Morph Market. The answer is I have not used Morph Market in the past. I might use it in the future. Um, typically, I'm not. I don't really produce morphs. Morph Market is really more for morphs. And there's a, a few other issues with Morph Market that uh, would preclude me from using it as it is. Um, where I sell the boas. Typically, I announce information about my boa sales on this channel. So when boas become available. You know, typically when they're born, I do videos about my latest births and I show off the new boas. And then typically animals will be for sale two months or so after they become established. And I'll let you know at that time. You know, in the past, I've sometimes sold on Fauna Classifieds. Um, sometimes people have contacted me through Facebook in order to get information about boa sales. And my Facebook name is just Brian Boas, the same as this channel. But it's kind of different every year. So if you have a question about a, a baby boa or availability, the best place to reach me again is through Facebook at Brian Boas. But if you subscribe and stay tuned to this channel, uh, I plan to release videos on a regular basis going over available animals. So probably the best way is just to stay in touch via this YouTube website. So the last question for today's video, someone actually just asked this question yesterday, and I thought I'd answer it because it kind of illustrates a point I want to make. But the question was, should I get a ball python or a boa constrictor? So this is another one of those questions where it really comes down to personal opinion. Both ball pythons and boa constrictors have a lot of really good characteristics they can make them great pets for certain people. I mean, that's why they're the most popular types of snakes that people are keeping as pets these days. But the ultimate choice comes down to your personal opinion and your personal situation. But the reason why I wanted to end with this question is I actually did a video uh, where I did a compare contrast to ball pythons with boa constrictors and I went over the pros and cons of each and how they compare. So this is the perfect video to watch if you're interested in answering that question. And I brought this up in today's video because a lot of the questions I get, I've done videos on them in the past. And in fact, at this point in my YouTube career, I have something like 300 videos. So it's a huge amount of information. Not quite sure how I managed to put out this much information or how people continue to watch, but I, you know, I thank you for your support and I hope the videos are helpful. But if you go to the Brian Boas YouTube channel and you look on my videos, you can do searches, okay? So if you have a question that comes up, you might wanna try searching there to see if I've already covered that question in a video. Um, you might wanna just browse to see the different topics that I've done you might come across new boas and new boa information that you didn't even know was available. So it's always a good place to look if you're interested in boa information. I even have different playlists of different topics. For example, comparisons of two different locality boas, my boa, my head-to-head uh, uh, -head comparison series. I've got videos on different types of locality boas, different types of morph boas, different types of caging, etc., building projects, racks, building cages, etc. So have a look and browse. And the reason I say this is because it seems like the vast majority of people on YouTube are just viewing new content. And unfortunately, the YouTube algorithm really doesn't promote older content all that much. They promote the newer content that's getting the views, at least in my experience. So I might release a video, it might get you know 1,000 or 2,000 views in the first week, but then the viewership kind of tapers off and it only gets a trickle of views. But the information is still there and it's still usable and it's still hopefully uh, you know valuable to people that want the information. So if you enjoyed my newly released videos, I'd really appreciate it if you go and have a look at the library of topics I've covered on the Brian Boas YouTube channel and maybe you'll find something that you find interesting or useful. So that's today's question and answer videos. Uh, as always keep the questions coming and I'll continue to do similar topics or similar videos to this one. Thanks for watching and enjoy your Boas.